here with me today, so. <laughs> Have you ever done something wrong? Why is it so complicated to answer this question? Because we all know, yes, we've done. And not something wrong. Many things wrong. Why is it so hard to respond to this question? Do you think it was easier if I had asked you this question outside the church, maybe on a regular day, when we were, let's say, playing football or having a trip somewhere or doing something, I don't know, uh, mundane, and I would just ask you, have you ever made a mistake in your life? And you would just say, yes, of course. But if I ask this question in church, have you ever done something wrong? You suddenly take some time to think. Why? Somebody asked me once, Pastor, why do you greet us with um, Happy Sabbath Saints? Why don't you say Happy Sabbath Sinners? <laughs> <laughs> it's right, it's correct. I, I won't be wrong if I say Happy Sabbath Sinners. In fact, I tell you something. If you come to church as a saint, you will go home with less benefits than if you come to church as a sinner. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. If you come to church with the feeling that you are a saint, you will go home with, with much, much less blessings than if you come to church with the feeling that you are a sinner. Do you know who's the greatest sinner of all times? Don't think this is a tricky question. It's not. If I decide that your answer is right, it'll be right. If I say it's not, it won't be right. So just give me an answer. Greatest sinners, sinner of all times. Paul said, it, it? Paul said I am the greatest sinner. And I, I'm not going to say, no, he's wrong. Come on, he's saying Paul. But how can he say he's the greatest sinner of all? Why would he say this publicly. I mean, if I say this morning here, my brothers and sisters, I'm just a sinner, and I feel that I'm the greatest sinner, it will be just be here, maybe you will gossip about me with some of your friends, with some of the members from Central, as if they don't know that I'm a sinner. But, and it'll be just there, because I'm not, it's just me, done, who am I? But if Paul said that he is the greatest sinner and he put it in the Bible, can you imagine how many people read this Bible throughout the centuries? How many, how many people knew that Paul confessed? He wasn't accused. He confessed this himself. He knew that. Why would he make such a declaration? Why? I'm not just asking for me to answer it. I want you to join me. Please, help me to understand. Why would he make such a confession? There are not millions, but billions of people, believers, non-believers, atheists, they all know what Paul said. Why would he say that? What do you think? Come on, help me. I want you to help me understand this. Because he was looking to Jesus Christ as his example and realized that he fell far short. So first of all, because he compared himself with Jesus. And when you do that, mm. <laughs> it's like heaven to earth. Mm. There is no even the slightest comparison, comparison yeah. between us and Jesus. Sure. You know, Job was considered... The what? A righteous man. One of the most righteous men mm. on earth. Mm. And it's God who said that. Well, compare Job with Jesus and he is so far. Mm. Right? What other reasons did you, do you think Paul had to say that he is the greatest sinner? Come on. Oh, 
Okay, he looked at his past and he was right. I mean, he couldn't just erase everything he did wrong before he met Jesus. His past was there screaming at him. He even called his past life, he was saying once in one of his letters, I can't remember which one, um, he says, my other or my old life. You remember when he says, my old life, my other life? Like he's dead to that, and now he lives a different life. So yes, he, he was honest. He says, I am a sinner. Look at me. Look what I did. I killed people. I, uh, innocent people. I've done many, many wrong things. Maybe he held himself to a higher standard? Maybe, yeah. A big, big responsibility, but... but um but again, you could say he compared himself with Jesus and then mm. that gave him new principles, new values in life. Mm. And when you look at those, none of us can mm. say, yes, I am there. I will uh, obviously mm. always fall short to that. Mm. On the Damascus Road, Jesus said to him, how long will you kick against the bricks? In other words, he was going against his conscience for a long time. <sighs> I agree with you with only this adding that I don't think he was against his conscience. He was against his creator. His conscience was quite clear. He knew better. That's true. What else? <laughs> Come on. We have to dig deeper. You see, if we don't do this, we will continue to do wrong and make mistakes and fall short. Yes, my brother. So, I think it's about proximity. The proximity and that um, the closer you are to perfection, the more useless you see yourself as and how more sinful you see yourself as. Right. So basically what you're saying is that the more he considered himself a sinner, he was in reality, in God's eyes, much better. Yeah, the other way around. As in, <laughs> Right, that's a different story. That's a different story. Okay, and that's a good thing. I mean, if you are a sinner anyway, and the only difference is that the more you get closer to Christ, you know you're a sinner. The further you stay to Christ, the less you know you are a sinner. Are you with me? Let me read this story for you. When he was asked, and not anybody asked him, but Peter himself, he asked him how often, and, and listen, the way he, he phrases this question, he doesn't say, how often should I forgive my brother? He could just ask that. How often should I forgive my brother when he sins against me? But his question is absolutely strange, completely strange. He says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? It sounds different. How often shall he sin against me? And I forgive. Up to seven times. What is wrong with this question? He's assuming he's never doing anything to other people. Number one, he's assuming that he's better than others. <laughs> right? Number two. You can go a bit deeper with this answer. And you'll get to the baseline. He's counting. Okay. He says, yeah, he is my brother. I have to, you know, close my eyes for a while, but eventually I, there must be a point where I should say, I'm sorry, brother, but you just crossed this line and beyond this line there is no forgiveness for you. Right? What else? Connect these two answers and you'll get straight to the point. How often shall my brother sin against against who? Against me. But who is Peter? Who am I so you sin against me? 
You can only sin against who? Against God. Against God. Because it's his law, and your transgression is always an act of aggressions against him, not against people. Because we are all, all sinners. And if you don't believe me that I'm right, just look at the story Jesus tells him. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he had begun to settle accounts, one as was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Is this a lot? Is this a huge debt? Or something insignificant? Well, let's see. As he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. Why would his master command this? His life, his wife, his children, everything he had to be sold. How big was his debt? It was major, major debt. It was so big that only their life I mean, their lifetime, if they would work for the rest of their life, all together, they wouldn't be able to pay it. It was so big. So the master says, their lives belong to me. Sell them. But the servant fell down before his master, and he was saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. What do you learn about his servant here? One word. Willing. Willing to do what? He knew he cannot pay back. There was no way he could pay back. If the master says, sell him, his wife, his children, and everything he has, then what can he do to pay back? And for how long? He knew he cannot pay back. He was desperate. He was desperate? He was completely out of his mind. How can you say, I will pay you back, when you were given all the chances in the world and you were not able? And now the master says, my friend, I'm sorry, but there's nothing you can do to pay me back. So I have to sell you, your wife and your children, your whole family, and everything that you have will be mine. And even this way, you will still not be able to pay everything that you owe me. So this man is not even aware of how bad his situation is. And that happens very often with us sinners. We do something and we think, oh, it's not a big deal. Adam and Eve, they just ate one fruit, so they thought, oh, we take these leaves, Put them around us, and it's all fine. Oh, God is coming. No problem. We just go and hide beyond that tree. I'll be fine. They lost their mind. They couldn't even reason properly. They become even ridiculous. Look at us. Don't look at your brother when he sins against you. Look at you when you do something wrong. And see how ridiculous you are and I am when I'm trying to excuse myself or explain why I did what I did. Do you know what's the only explanation for the things we do wrong? There's one answer. Why do people sin? Help me. Why do people sin? In our nature. Because we are sinners. Yeah. End of story. We are sinners. So when when you go and you see this tree there, he's, that, that's so nice, and you see it from a distance, that must be an apple tree. What do you expect to find in it? Apples. If you look at it and you know that's an apple tree, but you expect to find bananas and pineapple and grapefruits because you love those fruits and you think an apple tree should give you those fruits, then I'm sorry, but <laughs> you're never, never going to be satisfied with that because an apple tree will always give you apples. A sinner, all he gives you, and what is God asking for us? Give me. 
Why is God saying, my son, give me what? Your what? Your heart. Why? Where does the sin lie? Where does the sin live? Well, yes. That's it. And God wants the center of our universe. The center that controls our sinful life. Because otherwise, we will continue to do that. The master of the servant was moved with compassion. He released him and did what? Forgave him. So what is forgiveness? From this text and many others, it seems to be something so easy to do. To do. Tell me something. What happened with... Let, let, let's, let's make it simple, right? This guy owed his master $10,000. 10,000 tons of gold, okay? When the master says, I forgive you. I, I feel pity about you and, and I, I feel... I'm sorry, I don't want to punish you. I'm moved with compassion. I look at you, I look at your family, I realize... You're in a big trouble, and I don't want you to suffer. So I will just forgive you. What happened with those 10,000 tons of gold? Were they given back to the master? No, gone. As if he never, ever had it. As if he never had it. Well, that's not true. Mm. As if the man never had it. Mm. But the master... He lost it still. He lost it. Or you could say, he suffered the lost. You see, nothing in this world is vanishing. When God says, give me your sins, give me your heart, what is he doing with that? You think he has a, a safe where he puts all the sins of the people, all the hearts of the people? Well, what, what is he doing with those sins? Come on. He takes them on himself and he does what? He does what? Come on, you, you can't be wrong here. You know what's the, the answer to this question. What is Jesus doing with all the sins he took upon himself? That, that's what he does with us. But what's happened with him? He dies. He pays the price. There's always a price to be paid. Things don't just vanish, disappear. When you read this story, it looks like, oh, the, the master just said, oh, forget about that. I have plenty more there. Don't worry about it. When new sins are taken and, and put on Jesus' head, he pays the price for that. Everything is paid. Everything is paid. God doesn't ignore sins. He cannot ignore his sins. Because he dies for them. And that's the reality. So when this guy thought, oh, yeah, my master, oh, he might be very rich. I, I didn't even realize how rich this, this guy is. And he leaves. He's forgiven now. He's free of that. He goes out and he says, the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. 10,000 talents and 100 denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I will pay you all. You see, in human nature, we are all the same. You owe 100 pounds or 10,000 pounds, we are all the same. He was using exactly the same words the guy used before. Give me patience, be patient with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. 
but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw the, what he had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Now you tell me something. How much this other guy owed to the first servant? How much? Come on. He says, the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him how much? Now, I ask you again, how much did the other guy owe him? So, say again. Millions? Do you know what the answer is? <laughs> you always think that I have a tricky question. I don't. But the answer to this question is that his fellow servant didn't owe him anything. So is the Bible wrong? The other guy didn't owe him absolutely anything. Zero. Do you know why? And this is not a tricky question, but if you know the Bible, then you know the answer to this question. Why, when the Bible says his fellow servant owed him a hundred denarii, and when I read that, I say, no, he didn't owe him anything. Can you help me? Maybe my question is not clear. So, let's make this um, scenery, scenario, right? I owe you 10,000 talents. You... No, no. Let, me, let me just create this and then you, 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 you will understand. So, I owe you 10,000 denarii and you say, I've forgiven you. You don't owe me anything. Don't worry about it. I will suffer the the loss. And then I, I go and I meet my brother, and he owes me a hundred pounds. And I say, I mean, Mark says, no, he doesn't owe you anything. I say, yeah, he owes me a hundred pounds. I can show you. We have a paper. He says, no, 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 he doesn't owe you anything. Who is right? Me or him? I am right. So he owes me a hundred pounds. He is right. <laughs> Why? Come on. You have the chance to explain yourself. I will explain myself. The servant owed him money, and that's why he owed the master money. The master had to give him everything, so that should have followed down the line. Because you see, if you, you have to choose in which reality you live, if you live in the reality of your master, how much did he owe his master? Everything, basically. Too much. Too much. Yeah. Couldn't even count it. No. So those hundred pounds that he has to give me, those are not mine. To the master anyway. I don't have those money. Those money should go straight to her. Are you with me? Do you know what I mean? Now translate it into our human relationships. What is the story here? We owe everything to God. What do we have? The Bible says, the earth and everything on it belongs to the Lord. So how much does God have? Everything. He has everything. How much do we have? Nothing. But you see, we have to believe this. We have to truly believe this. And you know if we believe this in the way we treat each other. In the way we treat, we, we treat other people when it's about our properties. And I'm not, only talking, I'm not talking only about things and money and, you know, physical properties. What we need to understand is that people don't owe us anything. We all owe everything to God. All I can give God is my sin. And he's the one who pays my debt in the end. 
Jesus died for my debt. He paid. He suffered the loss. But he suffers not only my loss, but your loss as well, and everybody else's. So we don't owe anything to each other. And we have to stop treating each other as if the other one owes me everything. Because people, beings, human beings, all beings of the universe, they all owe everything to their creator. And there's only one creator in the universe. There's only one God in the universe. And you and me are not that God. Forgive me, but we are not gods. And it's time for us to realize that. We sometimes treat other people in such a way that we consider more important than them, better than them, as if they owe us everything and we don't owe anything to anyone. We judge them, we condemn them, we punish them as if we are gods, but we are not. And the master heard about this story and he said, he had called him, said to him, you, what is the word used here? I think all translations is the same word. What is the word used by the master? You, wicked servant. I forgive you all the debts because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? 